Okay, today what we're going to do is to uh, go through a, a what is probably my favorite chapter of Stanley Farlow's Little Dover reprint. Uh, the nice thing about this chapter is that it really shows how you can take uh, things like reaction diffusion equations, uh, partial differential equations that have convective uh, transport terms, and, and turn them into uh, equations that are the more canonical heat equation, wave equation, these kinds of things that we know how to solve, uh, that most books stop there and, and teach you uh, how to solve that uh, canonical set of, of partial differential equations, but don't really do much in the way of showing you how to convert other equations into ones that we can solve easily. Uh, so, so, you know, I think that this is a, a very practically important chapter, and, and that's what we're going to cover today, and we'll, we'll start with an example uh, that is straight out of uh, Stanley Farlow's book. Uh, so, um, so we're going to start with this simple reaction diffusion equation. We have a, uh, a, um, uh, a accumulation term, we have a, uh, a, a consumption term, a reaction term, if you will, and a diffusion term in this equation. And uh, we're going to suppose, uh, because this is not really exactly the diffusion equation that we know how to solve, we're going to suppose that we can combine these two terms, uh, accumulation and, and reaction terms, into one single term where we say uh, by making a substitution. So we're going to say that c of x and t is some function of time, which we will conveniently write as an exponential, e to the f of t, multiplied by uh, a new variable, u of x and t. So when we're done, this will become our unknown. Uh, so, so then in order to do this, we just go through and substitute this into, um, into our partial differential equation. The dc dt term becomes e to the f du dt plus f prime e to the f times u. kc becomes uh, the c just times k, uh, of course. And, uh, and then when I add these two terms together, I get, uh, I get three contributions, right? And uh, it's clear that we don't know anything about the derivative of u with respect to time yet um, and can't really say much about that. Uh, but what we can do is look at these two terms and recognize they're both proportional to u. Uh, and I can choose f any way I like. And the convenient way to choose f would be to say that its, uh, its first derivative is equal to minus k. Now if I did that, then this term would be the opposite of this term, and that would cancel these two these two things. So in order to get f prime of t equals minus k, we of course just choose f of t equal to minus kt. And, uh, and now when we substitute c equals e to the minus kt uh, times a new unknown u into our partial differential equation, uh, we get the cancellation by design. And uh, the partial differential equation, the Laplacian does nothing to the e to the minus kt term. So those appear in every one of these terms and they just cancel away and we're left with uh, the usual diffusion equation. Uh, so, so this is really just showing you that solutions to the reaction diffusion equation um, are, are just e to the kt times the solution of the regular diffusion equation. Uh, this, of course, is a, is a one variable, uh, one component reaction diffusion equation, and, and they can get much more complicated than that. But uh, similar ideas can be used to solve more complicated cases as well. Uh, so let's go on and also talk about uh, boundary conditions, initial initial conditions, and how we can convert equations into dimensionless form. Okay, so note that in this equation that we have up here, we have uh, something on the left hand side with units. The right hand side has units. We have various characters in here uh, that are uh, carrying you know meters squared per uh, second units, and and we would like to get everything into dimensionless form uh, so that we can compare, for example, uh, models of heat transfer. We can look up their solutions in a in a diffusion. Uh, uh, transfer mass transfer book. Okay, so let's suppose that we have boundary conditions at x equals a and at x equals b. Uh, what we typically do is to define a dimensionless axis x bar, uh, that is x minus a over b minus a, the the variable minus the left endpoint over the width of the interval, and that converts my old boundary conditions at x equals a and x equals b into x bar equals zero and x bar equals one boundary conditions, and we want to remember that when we change the variables, of course, we do have to go through and change the partial differential equation accordingly. Okay, so that's just done by using the chain rule. Uh, so I take x bar equals x over the length of my interval. And uh, this is actually a slightly different example here showing u of 0 and t boundary condition and a u of l and t boundary condition. 
And what's going to happen now is that when I take the derivative of u with respect to x, I get the derivative of u with respect to x bar times the derivative of x bar with respect to x, which is just the 1 over l term. Uh, that happens again when I take the second derivative of u with respect to x. And so when I plug this all into my partial differential equation, uh, I find that the partial differential equation becomes du dt equals diffusivity over length scale squared uh, uh, multiplied by the second derivative of u with respect to x bar. And my boundary conditions are also altered. So now I have a boundary condition at u of 1 and t that is this time dependent thing, uh, one at u of 0 and t that is this time dependent thing. And I have a, uh, an initial condition that says uh, what the function u of x bar is as a function of uh, of, of position. And I have to remember to scale the position variable inside that uh, other function now. Okay, so my dimensionless problem now has become, has become this. And the way we get this thing to be completely dimensionless, uh, note that at this stage we still had d over l squared hanging around in here. So we're going to use now a, a dimensionless time variable uh, that just, just takes advantage of the fact that d over l squared is an inverse time. So we multiply that inverse time by the real time, and we get a dimensionless time scale uh, that, uh, using the chain rule again, my time derivative term now, I get another factor of d over l squared on the left-hand side. That will cancel with the factor of d over l squared that was on the right-hand side. My uh, PDE now becomes, becomes this thing, which is now entirely in dimensionless variables and has no constants floating around inside it. They've all been absorbed into uh, the variables uh, x bar and tau. Uh, I also have to remember in my boundary conditions to scale the time variable accordingly and, uh, and that's what we're doing here. Um, and uh, we've also scaled similarly the spatial variable. Okay, so, so this process is very important because it tells us which dimensionless parameters are going to be important in the solution. And, and you know, if you, if you finished your, uh, your transport phenomena courses, you know that this, this is something that we use all the time in those areas. So we're going to think now about uh, this problem of diffusion in a, in a sphere. And we're going to use our, our little trick and see, um, see what happens to a reaction diffusion equation uh, where there's some reaction consuming species uh, that's diffusing into the sphere within its interior. Okay, so um, so this is the, the standard case where you think about uh, initial concentration inside the sphere being zero. Uh, that's the equation that we have right here, is uh, initial condition is zero. Uh, we have no diffusion through the interior of the sphere, uh, through the, or sorry, through the, uh, the center point of the sphere. Um, and so we can make the, the concentration profiles go to uh, have zero gradient right there, no flux through that point. And uh, we also have a concentration at the surface of the sphere, let's suppose that's going to be a function of time. Uh, so this is sort of the simple case where the concentration at the surface of the sphere is fixed. Um, but a couple of things are going to be different here. First, we have this consumption term, and second, we have a time-dependent boundary condition. So, so this picture that you learned in undergrad uh, probably uh, will not be what happens here. Uh, let's go through and see what we get out of, out of this problem. Uh, so C uh, is, is our unknown, and we're going to try and combine the reaction term with the accumulation term, and, uh, and what happens when we do that is we get uh, e to the minus ktu, that's the substitution that we just derived above. Uh, that now uh, has to be also incorporated into our boundary conditions. Uh, so our, what happened here is that our partial differential equation has gotten simpler. Uh, because we got rid of that reaction term, now writing the differential equation in terms of the unknown u. But our boundary condition actually, you know, you could say that this became more complicated, right? I now have uh, even more uh, stronger dependence on, on uh, time in my boundary condition. So we will be able to solve this, um, and that's what we're going to do next, is to deal with time-dependent boundary conditions. Uh, so. The, the first thing that we want to do when we encounter a time-dependent boundary condition or, or an inhomogeneous boundary condition in general is to try and make a substitution that makes those boundary conditions homogeneous. Okay, So all of our methods for solving partial differential equations result revolve around homogeneous boundary conditions. So let's suppose that we have uh, this situation. We have a, a nice, simple uh, diffusion equation here. Uh, we have an initial condition that is the sort of standard form. Uh, but we have these boundary conditions that are time dependent. So uh, what we're going to do in order to deal with this is to imagine that 
the solution is always being driven towards, uh, at every given point in time, the solution is being driven towards uh, the situation where I took the boundary conditions at that, at that moment and just froze them, right? So that's, that's establishing the driving force uh, that's, that's pushing the solution as time goes on. And, and so what we want to do is to come up with a false steady state solution to this problem uh, that will actually be time dependent. So it's not a real steady state, uh, but that false steady state will, will uh, satisfy this simplified equation. So we want to say that it is, um, that it is, uh, is now a steady state, so the time, time dependence in this equation is going to drop out. And, uh, and if we just integrate this naively, thinking of time as a constant, uh, we would find that any polynomial, first order polynomial of x, will make the second derivative with respect to x equal to zero. Okay, so this is now uh, a of t plus b of t times x. And note that I made these coefficients in my polynomial time dependent. I need to do that so that I can uh, always have my false steady state following the moving boundary conditions that are changing all the time. Okay, so my boundary conditions now uh, are that u of u false steady state at 1 has to be equal to h of t. Uh, of course, if I plug in x equals 1 here, I get a of t plus b of t. Uh, and then I also know that, it, that u false steady state at 0 has to be equal to g of t. Uh, that says that um, if I plug in x equals 0, I just have a of t here. Okay, so we have two equations and two unknowns. a of t plus b of t has to be h of t, and a of t has to be equal to g of t. Uh, that pretty uh, quickly identifies b as h of t minus g of t. And uh, so now we have our solution for the false steady state. We have uss, uh, steady state, uh, is uh, as a function of x and time. And uh, it is g of t plus x times h minus g of t. Okay, so uh, now what are we going to do with this? Uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to define a new variable now to make up for the fact that we did this strange thing, assuming this false steady state that's moving in time. Okay, so we, we can always take this function and say that the solution v, the v of x and t, uh, is, is actually uh, the real solution minus this false steady state. Okay, so this is the thing that we're really looking for. Uh, and we're going to write a new partial differential equation for the difference between what we're really looking for and this false steady state solution. Okay, so that difference is the function v. And uh, just thinking about how uh, the boundary conditions on u and the boundary conditions on uss uh, are going to behave, we can establish new boundary conditions on v, uh, our difference variable. Okay, so v of 0 and t has to be u of 0 and t minus the false steady state at 0 and t. And by construction, we made this false steady state so that it obeyed the boundary condition on this. So that's just 0. And v of 1 and t, uh, the same thing happens. By construction, the boundary condition on this uh, satisfied the boundary condition on this. So now our difference variable, v, uh, has also a boundary condition of 0. So we've created a problem now uh, in the difference uh, where we know USS uh, and we can solve for this difference problem because the boundary conditions in this, in this thing are homogeneous. But we're not quite out of the woods yet. Let's go and see what we did to our partial differential equation, right? So if we now take uh, the time derivative of u, that's going to be the time derivative of the difference plus uh, the false steady state. Uh, and we also have the second uh, spatial derivative of u. Uh, we know that the second spatial derivative of the false steady state vanishes, so it's just the second spatial derivative of uh, this variable v, the difference variable. Okay, so let's combine all of this. And uh, remember, our partial differential equation was that ut equals uxx. So what that translates into now, uh, ut is this thing on the left-hand side. Uh, and I've written out the USS partial derivative with respect to t. Uh, note that the, I just get a g prime of t plus x h prime minus g prime uh, for, that, for that particular term. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, vxx. And uh, so this is a partial differential equation with homogeneous boundary conditions. However, it is an inhomogeneous partial differential equation. So we can no longer solve this problem with separation of variables, but we can solve it with an eigenfunction expansion. That will be no problem. We know the eigenfunctions of this guy on the interval 0 to 1 uh, uh, are signs, and, uh, and we've derived them before. And so that's it.